So today's session is the second in a series of RLUK events exploring AAAF use in cultural heritage. Our first event gave an introduction to the framework from myself and from Glenn Robson, who is AAAF's technical coordinator. And if you missed that, it is available to watch via the RLUK website. Our event today will feature two presentations on using AAAF for digital content. AAAF stands for the International Image Interoperability Framework, and the framework is a set of open standards for delivering high quality attributed digital objects online at scale. It's also an international community that develops and implements the AAAF APIs. Our first presentation is from Scott Bradley and Valentina Flex from Newcastle University. Their talk will focus on their newly relaunched AAAF enabled website of the archive of Gertrude Bell, explorer, writer, archeologist, and colonial diplomat. The website contains a comprehensive and unique resource of newly digitized images of Bell's photographs, letters, and diary entries presented alongside transcriptions and other contextual information. Scott Bradley is a library system developer at Newcastle University and works closely with special collections colleagues to promote and facilitate the widest possible access to their rare, unique and distinctive archives and book collections via AAAF. Valentina Flex is a project archivist at Newcastle University Special Collections. Over the past two years, Valentina has been involved in the relaunch of the Gertrude Bell website, which is now AAAF enabled. Her current project, Beyond Margins, will focus on the creation of a geospatial temporal interface, which allows users to explore archival items within geographical and historical context. Our second presentation is from Joseph Padfield from the National Portrait Gallery. Joe will be exploring the use of AAAF at a national scale, how it can facilitate digital infrastructure, enable researchers to reuse digital content, and showcase dynamic applications of AAAF in documentation, examination, and reinterpretation activities. Joe Padfield is the principal scientist at the National Gallery in London with expertise in preventative conservation, digital imaging, and the organization and sustainability of heritage science data. So if we can go to the next slide, I just have some housekeeping before we start. Um, we are going to have time for some questions at the end of the session, but please feel free to post questions at any time during the event using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. The chat function is also open, so please say hello and let us know where you are joining from. If you are on X, then we are using the hashtag RLUKDSF. This event is being recorded and it will be made available on the RLUK website. And next slide, please. I think we are ready to start. So a big thank you to Scott, Valentina and Joe for giving up their time to talk to us today. And thank you to you all for joining us. And we are gonna get started with our first presentation now. So it is over to Scott and Valentina. Um, I am just going to start by giving you a little bit of context about Gertrude Bell um, and the archive. And then I'll hand over to Scott to talk about the technical parts. And then I will come back in at the end just to let you know what we're up to now. Um, so Gertrude Bell, for those who aren't familiar, um, she was born in Washington in County Durham, so she's quite local to the Newcastle area, um, in 1868. She was an archaeologist, a traveller and a writer. She travelled extensively, particularly in the Middle East, but also in like North America and East Asia. Um, she was later a member of British intelligence in the First World War. Um, she was heavily involved in the creation of the Kingdom of Iraq. Um, and she was also the founder of the Iraq Museum and she created the first antiquities law for the country. Um, and she died in Baghdad in 1926. So the archive contains over 12,000 unique records. So that's photographs, diaries, um, letters, reports, um, as well as like neg photographic negatives and photograph albums. Um, it spans 52 years and it covers lots of geographical areas. As I mentioned, she traveled quite a lot. So Europe, East Asia, North America, and the Middle East. Um, and the archive documents Bell's activities, so her kind of personal, archaeological and political activities, but it also portrays landscapes and people um, and intangible and tangible cultural heritage. Um, and as a result of that, it was inscribed on UNESCO's Memory of the World Register in 2017. Um, it is a really, really highly used collection. I mean, we do have a lot of different collections here in Newcastle University, but it is one of the ones that is constantly requested. People are always interested in Gertrude Bell and her material. 
Um, the archive is complemented by Belle's book collection as well. Um, that's her personal working library. And there's a lot of intertextuality between the archive and the book. So there's like lots of nice annotations in the books. Um, so it's a very, very rich resource that we have. Um, and it's also really important geopolitically as well as culturally and historically. Um, so the Gertrude Bell and the Kingdom of Iraq at 100 project, um, this project was um, kind of how the, the new iteration of the website happened. Um, the project was funded by the Harry and Alice Stillman Family Foundation. Um, and it basically the, the main goals were digitization, cataloging, the creation of a new website um, and the creation of an exhibition. And the main kind of focus was improving accessibility and preservation. Um, as I've mentioned, it's a really highly used archive all across the world. So we really wanted to make it as accessible as possible. So we are incredibly aware that it contains material and heritage that relate to lots of different people who can't always come to visit the archive. Um, so during the project, my colleague Graham digitized 13,000 items. So letters, diaries, photographs, and the photographs include the negatives, prints, and the albums. So these are all now available on the new website. Um, we also transferred photographic negatives into specialist st cold storage, um, and there, we created new cataloging, that's what I did, new cataloging with improved information and descriptions. Um, and as I said, one of the main kind of facets of this was then hosting all of this wonderful new resource, so the, the digitized images and the cataloging metadata, um, on a lovely website and you know how do we make the most of this resource that we've created um which is where scott steps in <laughs> thanks valentina yeah i'm uh thanks alison for the introduction as well but just quickly just uh, yeah i'm scott bradley i'm one of the library systems developers here at uh, newcastle university library i thought i'd start with just giving a bit of background about sort of our triple if journey at newcastle and i'd also like to apologize at this because it's a bit of a brain dump a powerpoint slide so please do bear with me and i'm also conscious that my wi-fi isn't great and there are some videos in this so if it's a bit glitchy once again apologies um, we started using IIIF around 2017 when we launched our then new digital asset, digital asset management system, bit of a tongue twister, Content DM. Content DM generates all the required IIIF manifests for us, and then we just sort of consume those into different applications. And since then, we've gone on and developed a lot of sort of uh, different IIIF components that can be used across a host of different library applications from your, your, you know, your traditional websites to kiosks and, and nearly everything in between. And if anyone wondered this, uh, this background image here is a, a triple I manifest from one of the Bell photograph albums. So what we use generally, we, we generally use a customized mirror door view for uh, the applications we develop, just because we find, you know, it has a lot of the features that we require sort of out of the box and it's relatively easy to customize. Uh, we actually use a stripped down mirror door viewer, you know, on some library web pages and our on our archival catalog Atom as well. And there it is in, in Atom. That's a, uh, a customized uh, widget within the Atom interface that one of my colleagues developed. Again, we use a customized mirror door viewer to display trip live generated content on kiosks in our exhibition space within the library. It, we, you know, we find it, it allows for a much more immersive experience for exhibition visitors. And we find it works really well when we have it alongside sort of printed materials that allows the visitors to see the, you know, the physical items in a, a secure locked display cabinet, but then in a way they can flick through the item digitally and, you know, zooming in to see the, the finer detail of the album. This is our current exhibition, Newcastle University at 60. It shows pictures over the years, once again, using Mirador and IIIF. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the things we like about Mirador is the ability to sort of customize the interface relatively quickly and effectively. You can see here, for example, we've gone with a black background in sort of a kiosk mode, as they call it, with the thumbnails along the bottom. But with Mirador, you can uh, easily tweak that with the buttons at the top right. And you can easy, e as well easily go into sort of a gallery layout as well for what I think is sort of easier navigation. We also work closely with the museum in Newcastle, the Great North Museum. Uh, last year, the museum hosted one of our Bell exhibitions. And once again, using IIIF to display some of Bell's photograph albums. I don't think the, the picture on the left anyway does it justice, but this kiosk once again sat along one of alongside one of our display cabinets. And similar to what I said earlier, it allowed the user to see the, you know, a page from one of the albums, but then using the kiosk, they could they could flick through the, the whole album. However, we don't just keep the our triple I work to ourselves. Exit University currently have a couple of uh, our uh, kiosks with a Gertrude Bell exhibition, while they've got a Gertrude, Gertrude Bell exhibition going on. Um, and once again, it's displaying one of the Bell's photograph albums. 
there it is in a slightly you know, more detail. We've also used IIIF for an application where branding is turning the pages. It allows access to some of our standout collections, you know, just with the click of a mouse. And once again, it allows for that rich immersive experience, something you know that was that was we don't think was ever really possible in the past. Okay, so yeah, moving on to sort of the, the Gertrude Bell website in, in in its overhaul. The site was in massive need of an overhaul. The old site sort of predated, predated me starting at the university and uh, added up the other day. I think I've been here 11 years now. Um, and it required a lot of updating from sort of the basic search to the way the image and the metadata was presented, which you can sort of see here. This being the old site search results page, which I'm sure, you know, I'm sure we all agree looks, you know, very dated and not very inviting and easy to use at all. This was the, and the, you know, this is the, the resulting, this is the new site search results play, page. It employs Apache Solar as a search engine, and it uses facets to help you find items you want quicker. And when, but when, you know, planning out the new website, we knew we needed to incorporate the, the triple IF because like Valentina touched on it, allows for this, that sort of enhanced accessibility. Triple IF allows website users to really interact with that material in a way, and I keep saying it in a way that they haven't before. And it's especially true for sort of the Bell's diaries and letters. For example, here is, you know, where Bell has scribbled notes in the margins. The user can now really zoom in and see that detail and, you know, maybe discover something that we, we might have missed. One of my favorites from the collections, and this is a video, so apologies if it is a bit glitchy at your end, is uh, where Bell's use tape to stick press flowers in. Triple IF really brings those details to life. And zooming into these additions really makes that the the uh, the item a lot more, you know, richer and more immersive. You can also see here on the right hand side there that uh, denoted with the Triple IF logo that we offer the user the ability to grab the Triple IF manifest that we use to generate the metadata in the image, and then they can use that metadata and image sort of you know anywhere else. Another great example of triple IF is this Japanese drawing of in one of Bell's diaries entries. You can really see the detail, I think, in the gold and the red threads when, when zoomed in there. And, and, and even the even the pin and how that's sort of degraded over time. And one of the last favorite of mine from is one of Bell's dance cards from uh, the Royal Mail ship Para on her way to the Caribbean date uh, 1898. Zooming it, zooming in again, and uh, even if you go sort of full screen. It really brings out the detail in that that printed card, and the, and the colors used, and and because it sort of has you know faded slightly, being able to zoom in sort of really brings those uh, details to life. What Triple IF also allows you to do is sort of resize Triple IF generated images sort of on the fly. So instead of having to either use something like you know Adobe Photoshop or even sort of CSS to achieve it, you can pass image coordinates to a triple IF URL and in return it'll give you like a cropped image sort of which you can see here so that the original image being the one in the background that's blurred slightly and then the new image in the foreground and all that was required was to where you can see we've highlighted in yellow there which is to add some coordinates uh, for the image and like I say it returns that that cropped image for us. We found this tool really, or this feature of Triple IF really useful. So what one of my uh, one of my colleagues again did was uh, they created this small little um, this small little app. Sorry, that you just need to enter the original image URL, and then as you can see here, you can drag the this box over the image that you want, and then then in return, once you've decided exactly how you want it to work. And then you copy the cropped URL and in return it will give you the image coordinates of the new URL. And then from there you can you know you can paste that into a website or into the browser. Uh, because of this sort of the tri this triple IF feature, ninety nine percent of the images on the Bell's website are triple IF generated images, meaning we only store very few locally, reducing duplication, ultimately saving on server space as well. I will, however, you know, be fully transparent here, just in case others are sort of starting out on this triple IF journey, and you know, maybe somewhere, you know, about a year, you may behind us, and some of the problems that we came across when we were when we were sort of implementing the new site, the problems we came across weren't necessarily due to the well, they weren't due to the triple IF framework. It was more the tools that were being used to generate the triple IF. As I spoke about earlier, our digital asset management system content DM serves that triple IF manifest, which we then consume into the Bell site, and like I said, in others. However, when we started to plan out the new site and the functionality required, we realized that the triple IF that was generated didn't always meet our exact needs. 
So for example, what I mean by that is Bell has a lot of diary entries which have been cataloged in content DM as what content DM calls compound objects or sort of a multi-page document, meaning a diary could be tens, if not maybe hundreds of pages long. However, with the new Bell site, we might only want to show sort of a subset of those pages. So, you know, for example, pages 10 to 17 of a diary, as that a diary could have been written over sort of different geographical locations or over different time periods, et cetera. And you can see that here with this 260-page um, compound object. Uh, however, with this example, you only wanted to show pages sort of one of two. And that, that picture there in the foreground is a, a screenshot from the, the actual Bell site. Uh, another requirement, which was one hour wish list, um, you know, uh, was to show item level metadata. So you can see here from within Mirador, you've got your item level metadata at the top. And then below that, you've got your object, le meta object level metadata. Um, meaning when you sort of, you're flicking through a multi-page canvas manifest, you, at the, well, when we started out, you would only see in the metadata for, uh, you weren't, sorry, you weren't seeing the metadata for the item you're on. You were just seeing the general object level metadata because content DMD didn't allow for this at the time. What we ended up doing after sort of speaking with both the developers of content DM as well as, as well as the IIIF community, you know, it was something quite straightforward and in a way, something I wish we thought about earlier. We called the content DM API. So when the manifest is requested and before it's sort of served to the user, we make a call to the this content DM API, passing, I think it's the collection and canvas ID. And in return, we get sort of item level metadata for that canvas. So all we had to do then was rebuild the manifest, including this new data. One problem we did encounter with this was solution, however, you know, sort of due to the number of API calls that we had to make, especially for those items, you know, with maybe many canvases long, so many pages long, was longer than maybe average page loads times. So we developed sort of a basic caching mechanism to store these cached items as basic text files on a local server. And, you know, this cache is cleared periodically and in case colleagues have made any updates to the meta, uh, excuse me, made any updates to the metadata. We do sort of have plans to further develop this cache into a more sort of a digital object repository where we can bring in and store triple objects alongside you know, other digital objects like TEI. However, that's still very early days. So it's something you know I might be able to cover at a, maybe at a future event. Um, I think that's all for me for now. Valentina will now sort of briefly cover the next phase, phases of the Bell project and sort of how we plan to further develop it, including sort of TEI and, uh, and maybe interactive mapping. Thank you. Um, so going forward, um, we're going to be embedding HTR, so it's handwritten text recognition, and TEI, uh, text encoded initiative, um, into the into the site. This is part of a kind of ongoing project called Evolving Hands, where we've explored both HTR and TEI using um, Bell's letters to create transcriptions and then encode the transcriptions with contextual information. So eventually we hope to be able to incorporate this into the site alongside the, the IIIF image. Um, the current project, which uh, was mentioned at the beginning in our introduction, uh, Beyond the Margins, is exploring geographical breadth of the archive um, by using a geospatial interface. So we have basically kind of two strands going on at the moment. We've got the development of the interface, which will sit on the website and will incorporate the metadata and the IIIF images that are already in the site, as well as metadata work that really involves myself and some students uh, working on tagging all of the items in the archive with a location. So eventually we will add all that metadata into the interface and we'll see all the items from the archive as pins um, on a map. So you can see this is like a little work in progress screenshot of our development site. Um, and this is pretty much what we're aiming for, which is representing the item on the left hand side. So using IIIF viewer, being able to zoom in and zoom out as much as you can on a full view like Scott demonstrated, um, whilst also incorporating this map view. Um, and we also hope to have a, a little kind of section where we can have exhibition type material so stories that link um, to items on the map and show a particular journey um, or a particular theme within Bell's archive. Um, Hi, um, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Joe Padfield. I'm one of the scientists working in the National Gallery, um, uh, looking a lot of how we work with data. I've been uh, exploring options for sharing images on the web for 
quite a while now, uh, but we've been looking at IIIF for a good few years, um, and I'm just going to try and summarise some of these issues in the next 20 odd minutes. Uh, and I apologise if it seems a little rushed, but a lot of it is uh, commented on in a report I will mention, so uh, the detail is available. Now, IIIF, as you probably already know, uh, fairly obvious is the International Image Interoperability Framework, as mentioned in the previous presentation. And it's an international plan or, or initiative to design to allow images to be dynamically displayed together from multiple locations without downloading them. So the concept is store once, use multiple times. Uh, and this, if you, if you went to the previous meeting, will be fairly straightforward to most of you. Now, in practice, what does that mean? So we have, uh, as was mentioned also in the previous uh, presentation, this concept of a manifest, which is almost a recipe uh, which describes information about images, about groups of images in a standardized format that can be understood by a number of different uh, uh, presentation viewers to allow you to explore the images. So if we look at this snapshot of a manifest on the left for the six images that are on the right, if you want to share these, the URL for the manifest is 72 bytes. The manifest itself is 9.7 kilobytes and the compressed uh, high resolution images is 180 megabytes. So it's a basically the concept of efficiency of sharing a lot of information. And this is just for six images. So if we're talking hundreds of thousands of images, the efficiency becomes quite obvious. Now, from our point of view, if we're working in the National Gallery, we have an image store, uh, including uh, large numbers of IIIF images and a IIIF server. So this is the software that takes a specially prepared image and will give you small image tiles and zoomed images as required. And we explore them using a variety of different Mirador-based uh, image viewers. Uh, Mirador was mentioned also in the, the previous uh, presentation. Now, if we take another institution, the Yale Centre for British Art, they also have an image store. They also have a very nice IIIF image server, and they have a public viewer. So it's not an internal one where you could explore a lot of their conservation images. Now, you can go in there and take that small text file or the link to that small text file and drop it into the internal image viewer within the National Gallery. So if we're working in this case in Mirador 3, we have an example of a manifest describing uh, images of a painting by Turner, but also then we can drop in the uh, manifest from the Yale Centre for British Art and within the National Gallery research environment, we can be comparing both these images at the same time. So IIIF obviously allows users to efficiently present and compare images from two different institutions at the same time while maintaining the connection. And this is the important bit, is that those images are still connected to the institutions they came from. These institutions can see that they're being used and where they're being used. People didn't need to download the images. You're maintaining that connection. This becomes even more important at scale, say, if one wanted to create a virtual national collection. So. Without a standard image framework, a potential national or even international collection would need to maintain a huge number of different custom metadata and image service connections. So if you think on the image on the right there, you've got all of these institutions, and potentially a lone little researcher down the bottom, marked in yellow, and they're presenting either structured linked data and endpoints or static data dumps, or potentially working through services. Now a national collection would have to work with, manage and potentially host a lot of that. This is a common problem with data aggregation systems, and it also leads to a disconnect between the image source and the presentation, as I mentioned before. Now, IIIF obviously solves that. So if all of these institutions and that lone uh, researcher is making use of IIIF, a national collection would only need to aggregate the metadata or even just reference the metadata published by these different institutions or services. Now, there are a few alternatives for researchers to publish IIIF content at the moment. I believe there's been a lot of development in the Internet Archive in the, in the, the last few years where people can host images, but there are other solutions coming along. So you don't necessarily need to be an institution to do this yourself. Now, the other thing to think about, and this you may not know as well, there's something called the FAIR principles. Now, across uh, data management in general, uh, across multiple fields, the notion of FAIR is used to try and help people guide them in making sure their information can be found and reused. As a series of principles, you can go and explore this uh, more, but the top level four are making sure that your information is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. 
Now, AAAF very, very nicely supports all four of these. Um, uh, so it makes it a very robust uh, standard for uh, working with data and working with uh, research environments and sustainable environments going forward. So IIIF enables precise metadata and URLs if they're persistent uh, for people to find digital images. They're obviously accessible. It's an open standard, so it's clearly obvious how you use them. Interoperable is in the very name of IIIF, uh, so allowing sort of cross-collection and cross-institutional integration and obviously reusable, um, but sustainability can be an issue because obviously uh, there is uh, a lot of development of IIIF, a lot of development of how institutions use IIIF. So the notion of the difference between IIIF as a presentation tool and as a research resource is an interesting issue to be discussed. Now, between the years of 2020 and 2022, uh, the National Gallery led uh, a particular a research project focused on the practical applications of IIIF. This was funded as part of the Towards a National Collection program funded by AHRC. And our main aims were to showcase some of the benefits of IIIF, investigate virtually connecting organizations together, examine the potential and use of existing tools, and then potentially look at what else we might need going forward. Now, <laughs> There's a lot of output from this project. It went on slightly longer than originally intended due to COVID, uh, but uh, we had quite a large amount of outputs. The final report, which you're all welcome to go and read, I'm, I've just checked today and it's almost been downloaded a thousand times now, which is quite nice. Um, we held uh, seven events, contributed to 16 others, uh, a number of surveys, um, and all of our webinar and seminars were videoed and recorded, and they're available through Zenodo or YouTube. And the work also fostered a number of very interesting discussions about potential future work. And we also provided a clear list of recommendations for the Towards a National Collection Programme in general, and the ongoing uh, research uh, funding from Arts and Humanities Research Council in this area. So it was a very successful project. But in addition to the networking and discussion, what I want to sort of show you today is we, we outputted a number of tools and demonstrators about the fun things you can do with IIIF. And I was going to show you four of them. Um, to go through here. Now, the first one was a simple IIIF discovery system. Now, many institutions are starting to offer APIs. So if you have time and you are of a technical bent, you could go and read the documentation and explore what they've got and search for content. Some of them include lists to manifests or uh, IIIF enabled images. So what this little project did was looked at how can we unify these across multiple different collections? So each of these collections have a different API. They have different ways to present IIIF content. So what this does is it produced a secondary set of uh, endpoints that all outputted exactly the same formatted data. You give it a text word and it gives you back manifests or IIIF resources to present automatically within a IIIF related viewer. In this case, Open Sea Dragon, but Mirador was also used within this project. So we connected together a large number of projects. Now, occasionally I have to turn off some of these institutions due to uh, updating of versions and stuff. Uh, the Smithsonian often needs to get turned off because you it kind of swamps everything else because uh, they have a huge number of resources there. And the National Gallery is currently down at the moment because we are changing uh, our endpoint. Um, but it allows you to do free text search and return to AAA of content across multiple collections. It's really good fun. Another one. So manifests were mentioned before. And depending on how much you know about uh, IIIF, there is also the concept of collections. So collections are groups of manifests or even groups of collections of collections. And we at the National Gallery have been presenting a set of high resolution images to support exhibitions or publications. So if you've ever read a journal in the past and it says, as you can see from the detail, and then you see this very small image that you can't really see and you're out with a magnifying glass or so zooming in on the PDF these days. But what we were able to do is present the PDF and supporting visible image, uh, images at the same resolution that the authors had access to. This was done by uh, a combination of tools, uh, pre <laughs> IIIF uh, image presentation tools and a number of databases. And what we did was we tried to do the whole thing with IIIF and Mirador. So effectively, this whole system now presenting content from a range of different publications, I think it's like 10, uh, 15 different publications or exhibitions on there now, are all done based on cached IIIF manifests and collections. So there's no database there. The system all just works on the manifests. 
and you can browse through, uh, have a sort of breadcrumb effect, be able to go up and down uh, the series of different uh, publications, explore, read the, the PDFs and explore the images. So it's a very nice way of doing it. We're hoping to do more with this to make it more generic, but at the moment it works really well with this particular uh, IIIF collection. Um, another one was the idea of data repositories. So uh, we've talked, uh, and I think sort of has been presented the idea of a given collection presenting their content uh, to tell a story or to engage uh, their audiences with their own collection. But if we're starting to look at generating research data, so things that support a publication or want to be the, uh, the foundation of future research, you want to create data sets that can be reused. So Zenodo, uh, if you have not heard of it, is the uh, catch-all data repository for the EU. It is free to use. You can upload any sort of data set you want and you get given a DOI for it and you can reference your work quite happily. Now, that works on a piece of software called Invenio RDM. And within the uh, Practical IIIF project, we were able to work with one of their developers, uh, Data Futures, to enhance the IIIF uh, uh, aspects of Invenio RDM so that we could stick IIIF enabled previews directly within this data repository. So uh, for a given set of TIFFs, in this case, uh, within uh, a Tudor portrait repository, there was a series of conservation images of this particular painting and the preview allowed you to just zoom in and zoom out on this simplified viewer. So that worked really, really well. And a lot of that technology has been integrated into the newer versions of Invenu RDM and Zenodo. So that was quite good. Now, the other thing to think of is that if you're an institution, you say, well, this is my manifest, this is my list of images. But what happens if you want a different list? What happens if you want to explore alternate lists? Um, users generally do not want to look at these manifests. They're written in a format called JSON, and you have to be of a particular mindset to want to go in and edit them by hand. So we needed a more user-friendly approach. So the project also supported the development of a web-based user-friendly tool to make manifests. So you can pull in existing manifests, cut and paste them together and create new presentations to tell new stories. So it's all open source, it's on uh, GitHub. It was produced by a company called Digerati um, and you can go and have a little look, but this is sort of a, a rough idea of the screenshot they have where you can very, it's very much a drag and drop. You can see exactly what images are available and add in metadata for them. Um, it's, it's a very nice tool. Uh, which we're hoping to use more in the future. Um, the other thing to think about as well is that IIIF doesn't have to be static. So uh, we often talk about the idea of, I have a collection, I've made my manifest, these are my images, please have a look at them. But there are many examples of use where you want these manifests to be dynamic. Uh, an easy example of that would be uh, search results. So if you wanted to encompass and save this, the results for a certain search, in its own manifest uh, that could be reused. Um, these search results, you could generate lots of them. You can also have changeable groups of images or even sort of annotation uh, based situations where you're adding to an existing manifest. As an example, instead of images of an object or a work by an artist, think of an institution might want to present a manifest of a given room or a given location or a given building or even given geographical space, thinking about what was discussed in the, the previous one, previous presentation. Uh, but within institutions, object move. So if you asked for the National Gallery Group uh, Gallery 54 uh, manifest, that might be different one day to the next. So there is a certain aspect of dynamic nature and potentially versioning that may need to be considered here. Now, as a example of annotation, we use IIIF uh, enabled sort of technology in, in this uh, customized documentation system within the National Gallery. So. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, when paintings are examined, we often take very, very small samples, microscopic samples from the surface of the painting to study the materials used to create it. And in this case, we have a Mirador 2 version, uh, uh, version 2 of Mirador uh, interaction with the database where people can zoom in, annotate a particular point right on the particular crack where the sample came from, and then uh, fill in uh, a related form that will allow them to define uh, what that sample is. Now, the uh, eagle eye of you may have noticed that some of the sample details are not tremendously accurate. Uh, this particular painting I use as a test case, so it's easier for me to display. 
Um, but this is a password protected administration system used by one department. Now, if we wanted to share that information with other departments or potentially the outside world, what we then do is repackage all of that information and present it within Mirador 3 for the rest of the institution. So here, if you do a search in our uh, internal collection image viewer for that particular painting, NG1234, you can get all the paintings, all of the samples, and then a specific image presenting the sample site. So again, this can be read-only presentation of the same information. So not only are we using IIIF in one place, we're actually reusing the IIIF information in two places to get more. So you can see a very nice interaction between the samples and location and the information that we have. The other things we start to use IIIF for is other exploration of images. So it's not just the presentation images, but it's the study and uh, examination and reinterpretation of these images. And this is one example of, uh, which is written up in the technical bulletin, I think number 41, uh, where um, this particular painting, they're exploring what pigments have been used. And uh, a particular analytical technique called XRF has been used to try and identify which elements are present in which paint passages. And then the images can be registered and effectively Mirador 3 allows you this option to change the transparency of one over the top. So this particular image here on the left is a blending between the visible image and the copper map to show you roughly where copper uh, can be identified in the surface of the painting. But then you can compare that obviously with Mirador with just the straight visible image or x-rays or infrareds as you need. So this is something we use on a day-to-day -day basis as an actual study tool uh, rather than just a presentation tool. The other thing to consider is how we group images. So you can just say, well, here are all the images, but as was commented in, in the previous presentation, you may have hundreds, if not thousands of, uh, of images against a particular object. And for certain applications, you may want parts of that or all of it or subsets or, or different presentations. So here is an example of uh, all of the images coming back from a particular painting, the Giovanni Bellini, uh, Dominican uh, monk, attributes of St. Peter Martyr. And here we've got visible images, we've got x-ray images, we've got infrared images, we've got photomicrographs, samples, and some XRF going further down. And different users within the institution may want to see different things. So we are exploring the idea of having a different default manifest for, say, a curator than we might have for a scientist or a conservator or even the education department. So we're playing with how we package this. We're trying to look at this concept of trying not to hide everything, but just trying to promote the things that are more readily useful for people. And IIIF allows you to do that, which is it's very functional. Now, just to give you an example, these, these images of Peter Martyr, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful little uh, painting. It was edited somewhat in the past to make it slightly more saleable. And someone put a big knife in the person's head and a big sort of uh, dagger or sword in their chest. Um, but these selection of images where you've got the original visible image, you've got um, an X-ray, an infrared, and then some compositions that have been created to try and re-establish how the painting might have appeared in the pre in, in the originally before these additional attributes were added. Um, so again, this is a, a study tool, but it's it's sort of a presentation of a story of the painting. And this set of registered images can then again be explored this way or presented in different structures. So just to finish off, um, IIIF is an international standard for presenting and working with images and AV and soon 3D. Um, it provides a reliable, efficient foundation on which other systems and tools can be developed, whether that's internally within one lab or whether it's internationally across multiple institutions or large scale uh, research infrastructures. And it can also be a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joe. That was a fascinating um, video one. You can see me. Um, yeah, thank you to Scott and Valentina and Joe for all of their presentations. Um, there is so much to work through here. Um, we have had a few uh, questions have come in. I am going to start with one that's been addressed to Valentina because I know she has to step out a little bit early for another commitment. Oh, um, I've got a question from um, Ruth who has, would like to hear more about your um, HTR and TEI plans for uh, the project. Yeah, so um, I cannot speak as like the only person that was involved because there was a couple of different people involved in different levels in the Evolve Enhance project, but I can give you kind of an overview. Um, so the project was our first kind of exploration into HTR and TEI, um, and it was um, like another member, a 
interdepartmental, I suppose you would say, project with one of our colleagues in um, the School of English, uh, who kind of specialises in digital humanities. And um, there are other uh, institutions that are involved in other kind of parts of the project. So they're doing basically the same thing, but with different material. So what we have done, or we have what we did was um, we started by recruiting student placements um, and they used the digitized images of Bell's letters, which we already have because of the digitization project. Um, and they used Transcribus software um, mm -hmm. and they, they scanned that through. And we thankfully we have transcriptions already of a lot of this material because people did it. Um, a long time ago thankfully uh, saved us all that work and yeah. um, so we used the transcriptions that we had we used the digitized images that we had fed them into transcribus and created a model to read bell's handwriting then my That's colleague cool. um alex did an amazing job helping the students with that and learning how to use this to teach them i was more like consultation for the tei part when it comes to contextual information but i'll get to that so and um, that's what Alex and the students were doing in the first um, instance. And then we used, um, we selected kind of like a batch of letters. They consulted me as to what ones might be most historically interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and we scanned the digitized images of those ones so that Transcribus would create its own transcription. Right. Um, and then on top of that, we used the TEI um, to add contextual information to particular things within that transcription. So um, like names to explain who people are, places or just kind of concepts. And the chunk of letters that we picked was kind of around 1921, um, around the kind of creation of the Kingdom of Iraq and the crowning of King Faisal. So there was a lot of things going on and a lot of concepts in these letters that if you didn't have historical context, you, would, you wouldn't you would know what they were sure. talking about. Um, and a big thing was like reducing that barrier to access. The project was um, heavily kind of like focused on the methodology. So how we did it and what problems we encountered so we could then report back about how that worked. Um, but as I was kind of like more on the content side of it, I was very excited just about the fact that we could embed this information um, mm. directly into the, the transcriptions. Um, so that was kind of like how that worked. And then now this phase of the project, we're looking to embed it onto the site um, so that we can present the IIIF um, image of the original item, uh, the transcription that was created by uh, Transcribus, and then kind of like layered on top of that would be the, the TEI. Um, and Scott would have to tell you a bit more about the technical side of it, because that's not really my my area. Yeah, well, I think you've, you've covered it in, in great detail there, Valentina. So yeah, like Valentina mentioned, I, I, it's it's still a proof of concept at the moment. We're working with colleagues in the uh, research software engineering colleagues to create sort of a, a reusable widget for this TEI. So yeah, you would have the this the triple IF image on the the left hand side, and then the TI document on the right. So you can sort of compare like for like. And like I said, it's still fairly early days. I think the project is summer of this year, if not the back end of the summer. Um, so hopefully by then we might have you know something a bit more. Um, you know, to show anyway. And then we do have plans to do a similar project with other material, um, which we kind of haven't really started on yet, but that kind of like has been ruminated. So as Scott said, this is like a proof of concept and then we can go ahead and replicate this with something else. That sounds so exciting. And even just the work that you've done, I think to put a triple F viewer into Atom, I think it's a very exciting um, development. So uh, yeah, you guys are spearheading lots of lots I did notice one questions things. about that. Uh, about yes, a little technical question. Um, which version of Mirador were you using? Uh, we use version three. The reason okay. why, and it's a bit of a lazy answer this, was because it integrates with content DM. I remember right. that because we've been using it for a few years now. If I remember correctly, it was because it integrates better with, or it did anyway at the time with Content DM. Mm -hmm. And like I said, a bit of a lazy answer. It does have, I think, if I remember correctly again, sort of additional accessibility and additional features of a, obviously version two. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the that's the the quick answer. I think. And are you using um, presentation version uh, two or three on your um, AAA F API? It's version three. Version three. Yeah, yeah. And what do you? What's your feeling of the difference? Are you, um, are you happy with that choice? Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, like I said in the in the presentation, I think uh, because it, we know I, I I have used version two, but not in anger necessarily. Yeah. Um, but version three, as I said in the presentation, allows for it. It already offers so much of what we already wanted, and it allows for that customization really easily. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah. So yeah, to answer your question, yeah, it, it, it does everything we want. And what's it been like um, working with content DM? And the question was, do you share code publicly? So I'm wondering yeah. how much do you, how much have you built on what content DM does out of the box and how much? Yeah. So, well, not box? necessarily with content DM, but I think to answer the question around, I think it was about the widget within Atom. Yes. That, once again, I keep, I feel like I'm a broken record here, but that is also a slightly a proof of concept. We're nearing the end of that. But once that is in a position to go live, yes, we're more than happy to share that, whether that should be via. Oh. Or, or by uh, you know via you know via colleagues yeah we it's very happy. welcome news Fantastic. Yeah. It's, I, I can't take credit for that there's a colleague you know a, a colleague of my team that that's working on that but uh but yes we're, we're more than happy to share that brilliant i mean the other theme that's come up has been around um copyright and image sharing so um this obviously depend on your own approach at newcastle and what your um uh, your, your kind of cultural appetite for sharing images is but this is this comes up a lot when people talk about AAAF and very sort of frightening this idea of just putting everything um out there um what's what what is your approach at Newcastle and um how how do you feel about just people just being able to download everything well the thing is we have this kind of the Gertrude Bell archive is quite unique in a lot of ways for example the Evolving Hands project we were really lucky to already have transcriptions and to have yeah. digitized images to use with that um, equally, our old site that Scott showed like very briefly in his presentation, um, there have been scans available online of these images for a long time. So yeah. that website predates us and they've been on there since that website went up. So that's quite mm. a while. Um, and I know that a lot of people do take images and use them, don't necessarily ask or credit. And I know that because I've done a lot of reverse image searching and this ah. work. And Facebook has been incredibly helpful, so I can't I can't like denounce anyone um for using them. A lot of local history groups in different places around the world okay. um use them. Usually we're, we're like we're pretty open and um, we mm. do like ask that people credit us um because the the copyright such as there is does reside with us um but equally the thing is like people have been able to take them for all this time if they want to and th there is an aspect of like if someone really wants to use something without seeking permission or um or re re referring to us or whatever they will just do it of course yeah. can. um and I think yeah so the main thing was just just making them accessible um which is what we have done and it's kind of like we've just sort of had to accept that that's okay I this is what yeah. um, AAAF does so beautifully though isn't it so it allows you to share images in a far more responsible way than has ever been possible in the past so you've got a viewer there where your images are packed up with their metadata and where mm -hmm. they come from and somebody can share a link to something that they found on your website and it doesn't matter if they put it on their website, it, it's, it'll all be linked back to you eventually. And it's not about controlling the images, is it? it's about so people would see an amazing document and think, I want to see this archive, what else is there out there? And they can find you, yeah. right? So I think the, the benefit do. of having people contact us for permission, like we always say yes, like we're, mm -hmm. we have a stop answer where we're like, yes, of course, this is, we ask that you credit us, this is how yeah. we ask that you structure it whatever um like someone recently asked if they could use an image on instagram we were like yeah of course um mm. thank you for asking how but, nice to ask yeah yeah i know i was like bless like bless them for like taking the time to ask um but the good thing about that is that it's nice for us to know where things are used just because it's nice to know that people are using them but equally yeah. you know they, yeah sorry Brilliant. i don't know if that's much of an answer that's <laughs> do you want to jump in joe um i was just going to say that if you are able to share some of the code of what you're doing, Scott, there's a very nice process that if you share them on GitHub and then you make releases from GitHub, you can hook yep. that up to Zenodo so you get a DOI for your releases. Mm. All right, okay. so effectively, it's very, very sort of easy and nice for people to be able to then reference your work and to say where it's come from okay. and which version of your work you're doing if you're developing it. Okay. Um, and it's just a, a nice way to maintain that sort of citability or attribution yeah. really to be able to say who's done what um so no, have a little look at that it's 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 quite nice I mean, you you could set it up so it will automatically create your new uh doi every time you do a release <laughs> it's, okay. it's yeah. sort of pretty streamlined really i um, think historically in, for no reason but we we haven't really pushed that you know a lot of the stuff that we've done out to git or, or, or similar repositories but it is something that we definitely want to do, you know, going forward. We've uh, a colleague who was recently recent starting the last two years is all for it. So yeah, it is something that we, we're looking into. Yeah. 
that there are also some triple f's got a community in zenodo as well okay so effectively you can connect things that you do to other things in on triple f within zenodo it's uh mm. what's happened in the last few years i can't remember exactly when well, thank you I think there are a lot of people very interested in this atom integration and myself mm -hmm. included so yeah we'll watch this space um there was a question on conservation and um, this is a collection that's largely kind of late, late 19th century did the age of the material make it easier to digitize that content um considering that it was in maybe like better condition than older material or were the things that kind of created challenges for the digitization process too I would say take this answer with a pinch of salt because I didn't digitize it. So when I yeah. say it, I don't think there were any issues, my colleague, <laughs> right? yeah. um, was it more, was it, was it, was it that it helped? Mm, I think that sometimes if something is like around that period, it can be more difficult because it can be mm. like, like there are a lot of items that we have that are older that are in far better condition because of the material that they were made with. I mean, I'm not this conservative. This is the answer that I give as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like sometimes that is actually easier when it's older because it it just lasts longer. It's yeah. better quality. Paper is better, better quality. Yeah. Like um, so I don't think there were any issues there were things that my colleague Graham had to be careful with. For example, the inserts, as we've seen that Scott showed, um, I very carefully replaced the pins with entomology mm. pins. She used just like old kind of metal pins and they were rusting. Sure. Um, but there was so there were like fiddly things. Um, the photograph albums, which you can see on the website, are really big. They are kind of like um bound together by like almost like a kind of material canvas buckle, two buckles. Mm -hmm. So Graham actually unbuckled them and did it like page by page loosely. So he was able to wow. do that. I don't think there was really any issues in digitizing, but I do think that the big obviously stating the obvious, but the big thing about digitizing is that it's a weight off in terms of preservation of because course. those photograph albums did have to, like they are, aren't are taken out very often, they're very unwieldy, they're very difficult to handle. Um, they're all going away for conservation now, but even even stabilised, they're quite difficult. Um, and this just means that we can like reduce, reduce the handling. But um, if anything, actually, I'd say the book collection would be more problematic, but that hasn't been digitised yet. So okay. <laughs> that that's might... what's maybe next on the horizon for you guys. <laughs> Um, talking about next on the horizon, Joa was wondering, what do you think next next for the towards the national collection outputs? Um, you know, from all that work that was carried out over the last few years. You know, where where, where next? Well, there's there's um, my understanding is that the towards the national collection, uh, the project I talked about was a foundation project, and then there was a series of larger discovery projects that came out, which are coming towards an end now. And the program is then putting together recommendations for future funding. So this could be fairly sizable uh, uh, sort of bands of funding that would come out of AHRC into the multiple millions of pounds. But I, I don't know specifically sort of numbers or whatever. But a number of the recommendations that came out of that AAA project have made their way, I believe, into that final report. Um, so the, the recommendation that sort of AAA should be used more as a sort of a standard way of doing it within heritage science rather than a, a, an interesting thing if you've just happened to speak to the right person so i think working with uh, sort of funding bodies to say all oh, right you're doing a project with images have you considered mm -hmm. um or even you will need to uh, i think could be a, a very nice way of, of looking to it there have been some discussions about trying to push triple af as a national standard um, but no one's sort of found time to do that yet. Um, jumping through the administrative hoops, um, but that's something that has been discussed as well. Um, the other big thing on the horizon, there is um, another big funding structure called Riches, mm. which is building the research infrastructure for the UK. And one of the funding outputs is to build a UK data repository. And it may well be wonderful if a free UK data repository for heritage included IIIF. Of course. So yes. we'll have to sort of see how that's done and, and who's going to be putting that together. But that could be a very nice opportunity if uh, small uh, institutions or researchers were able to then uh, deposit their research outputs in a UK repository and then automatically have IIIF manifests and uh, uh, resources for it so i think okay. that type of ability for everyone to do this rather instead of just the people with large 
supportive IT departments, uh, yes. I think is where it will become so much more um, ubiquitous, basically.